When it comes to the Queen Elizabeth class battleships, a couple names stand out. Those, of course, being Warspite and Barham. Warspite because, well, Warspite. I don't think the grand old lady needs any further introduction. And Barham is known for her sinking, probably the most widely and inaccurately used archival footage out there. However, that leaves three other battleships, and today's video will look at one of them in the form of HMS Valiant, the third of the class and a ship with a wide range of luck, fortunate enough to escape damage at Jutland, and unfortunate enough to suffer repeated damage while docked. And yet, the ship would survive both world wars. That's nothing to sneeze at in its own right. So, with that in mind, let's look at the story of HMS Valiant in this video. Valiant's tale began when she was laid down on January 31st, 1913. The ship would be launched on November 4th, 1914, which was a pretty average speed. Somewhat surprisingly, things didn't slow down much after that launch. If you know your dates, you can probably guess why this is surprising. November of 1914 was well after the Great War kicked off. This would, as you could expect, cause a slowdown in general construction. Resources were shuffled around, projects were changed in priority, and all of that fun stuff. That said, as a Queen Elizabeth, Valiant was at the upper end of the priority list. So her fitting out wasn't as dramatically impacted as it could have been. The ship was commissioned on February 19th, 1916, a year and a couple months after she was launched. This wasn't a bad pace at all, although it does mean Valiant missed most of the early naval conflict. Although she wouldn't miss Jutland. But before we can talk about that, Valiant's design needs to be covered. As a Queen Elizabeth class battleship, Valiant was one of the most powerful afloat in 1916. Displacing roughly 33,000 tons at her standard load, she was also quite heavy. This only rose to around 34,000 at the deep load, quite big for the time, and a necessary size to carry her main feature, eight 15-inch 381mm guns. Those would prove to be a very capable weapon in two world wars, and Valiant carried them in what became the traditional layout. Four twin turrets, all on the center line. Two super firing on the bow, and two super firing on the stern. To support those, the battleship also carried 14 single 6-inch, 152mm guns in the traditional casement mountings. Rounding off the weaponry past that point were two 3-inch anti-aircraft guns, and four 21-inch torpedo tubes. Those were carried below the waterline, with two on either broadside. To protect all that firepower, Valiant was heavily armored, a 13-inch, 330mm main belt. The deck armor was less impressive, ranging from 1 inch to 3 inches at the thickest, 25 to 76 millimeters for the metric audience. This wasn't great, but it was also on the higher end for the time. What was good, however, was the speed. Valiant could manage around 23 to 24 knots on average. While the design speed was 25 knots, this was rarely reached in practice. Not even with their 75,000 shaft horsepower through four shafts. And with that, we've reached the end of the design detail. Now back to the service history, which, as I alluded to earlier, began with the Battle of Jutland. In this, Valiant joined her sisters, aside from Queen Elizabeth and Refit, as the 5th Battle Squadron. As a group, they would be assigned to support the battle cruisers for the upcoming operation. Of course, through a parade of miscommunication, that didn't happen. The 5th Battle Squadron lagged behind and only caught up towards the end of the initial battle cruiser action, just in time to fire on the retreating German ships. Valiant directed her fire towards SMS Moltke, landing at least one hit to the stern. As they chased the battlecruisers, however, the rest of the High Seas Fleet came into view. This would result in the 5th Battle Squadron being focused on by much of the German fleet, 
The damage that War Spike took, in particular, is legendary. Barum also took some hits, as did Malaya. Valiant, however, proves something of a charmed ship. She only sustained splinter damage, despite all the fire directed at the British formation. It's actually impressive, really, considering the damage her sister ships took. As for her own fire, Valiant fired a total of 288 15-inch shells and 91 rounds from her 6-inch secondaries. Either way, Valiant returned home at the conclusion of that battle. It would be the only time she faced the German fleet head-on. However, this is also the time period where Valiant suffered the first case of misfortune and harbor that would plague her career. In this case, by being the second of the Queen Elizabeths to be rammed by HMS Warspite. This coming after Barham. Valiant's turn came on August 24th, 1916, while in Scapa Flow. How much damage Warspite did is unclear. Bert notes it as considerable damage, but in the very next sentence says the damage was repaired by September 18th. So, make of that what you will. Regardless, this would be the last excitement of the Great War for HMS Valiant. Even the aforementioned Burt book makes note of nothing else happening until after the war ended. One can presume Valiant was present for the surrender of the High Seas Fleet at the very least. Otherwise, it would have been a lot of patrols and training. While trying to force the Germans to an engagement, that never came. In any case, with the end of the war, Valiant entered into a long and pretty quiet peacetime. In 1919, she joined the Atlantic Fleet. The ship would remain there, operating on training cruises and other such things, until 1924, at which point she transferred to the Mediterranean Fleet for much the same duty, more training and the odd port visit. Frankly, there wasn't much going on for the Royal Navy in the 1920s. This held true for Valiant, with the only notable thing in that decade being a pair of refits. The first came in 1927, lasting from February through July. The second was in 1929, at the tail end of the decade. This one lasted from March 1929 through to December of 1930. A fairly lengthy refit, but not the major reconstruction that would come later. The major changes in 1929 came to the superstructure and torpedo defenses. The bridge was expanded a bit and generally reworked. The more visible change, however, was definitely the funnel. The two funnels were trunk together into one much larger stack. The ship also picked up a catapult on the stern. In addition to those visual changes, Valiant lost the torpedo tubes and gained torpedo bulges. All of these changes brought the displacement up to just under 36,000 tons. Valiant would only serve in this design for a few years, as it turned out. She was in the Atlantic Fleet from 1930 through 1935. This included two things of note. First, the Invergordon Mutiny. This came on September 15th, 1931, and is a very complex topic to get into. But for the short version, it was kicked off by Great Depression-related pay cuts in the fleet. When that was settled, Valiant remained in the Atlantic fleet, even as the second event came about. That being the name change to Home Fleet in 1932. Nothing really changed for her service, it was just a change in the fleet's name. The actual change came in July 1935, with another transfer to the Mediterranean. A short-lived one, as it turned out, because Valiant would go in for a second major overhaul in March of 1937. This was much more of a rebuild and lasted until November 1939. Valiant would come out of it looking almost like a new ship, at least above the waterline. The old bridge was replaced, for example, by a new bridge tower, a very distinctive one that was used on all the major rebuilds. Similarly, the trunked funnels were replaced by a new single stack. That change went along with a new power plant, now featuring eight new boilers and four new turbines. This replaced worn machinery with new models. It also increased standard power to around 80,000 shaft horsepower. 
which mostly served to keep the speed in that same 23 to 24 knot range, even with the extra weight added to the ship. The other visual differences in this rebuild came with the aircraft equipment and the secondary battery. The amidships part of the ship picked up a large gap. Here a hangar was put in place to carry a couple float planes, along with handling equipment, a crane and catapult for working them. The secondaries, meanwhile, were removed entirely. Unlike Warspite, Valiant, and Queen Elizabeth completely swapped those out. The old 6-inch guns were replaced by 10 twin mounts for 4.5-inch dual-purpose guns, a total of 20 barrels. Six of the mounts were clustered around the bridge on either side of the ship. The other four were carried lower down on either side of the aft superstructure. Those were supported by four octuple pom-pom mounts, 32 barrels in all, along with 16 50 caliber machine guns and four quadruple mounts, two atop either super-firing turret. Changes to the armor mostly consisted of deck armor being raised to 5 inches at its thickest, along with 4 inches placed where the casements used to be. All of these changes brought the displacement up to around 36,000 tons. That does round off the rebuild, so now we can return to service history, which began fairly quietly all told. As I said earlier, Valiant's rebuild concluded in November of 1939, November 30th to be precise, for her recommissioning. Of course, by this point, the Second World War had begun. Valiant would not, however, join right away. The ship was sent off to Bermuda to join the West Indies Station for working up. She departed Britain on December 11th and arrived in Bermuda on December 22nd where the ship would remain into the new year, before spending early 1940 escorting Canadian troop convoys across the Atlantic. This took place in January and February of 1940. Then, from March through June, Valiant operated in support of the Norwegian campaign, mostly on escorting convoys, especially troop convoys. The most exciting thing for Valiant came in a Luftwaffe attack on April 9th. And at some point during this, she was also fired on by the submarine U-38. This, thankfully for Valiant, would miss. With the end of the Norwegian campaign, however, Valiant turned south. The battleship returned to her old stomping ground in the Mediterranean. Departing Britain on June 28th, Valiant would arrive in Gibraltar on July 2nd, and then promptly depart on July 3rd where Valiant would, for better or worse, participate in the attack on Merz el Kabir, shelling the French fleet in port. The second time she turned her guns on another fleet, and it was an allied one. Not exactly the greatest achievement for Valiant, and an absolute mess of a topic that really requires a dedicated video. In any event, after that was done, Valiant would spend the rest of 1940 on various escort duties. For most of the year, nothing major happened outside the odd air attack, or submarine attack, none of which damaged the battleship, with the result that Valiant only fired her main guns in anger again on December 19, 1940, in a shore bombardment targeting Valona in Albania, which was fairly uneventful other than the bombardment itself. After this, 1941 would progress in much the same manner, for the most part, Valiant spent her time on either escort duty or shore bombardment. The former would see her attack by aircraft on January 10, 1941, which saw only splinter damage while Illustrious was heavily bombed. The latter saw, among other things, the bombardment of Bardia on January 3rd. Either way, there was very little of real note for Valiant outside of a couple exceptions the first of which being Kate Mattapan. While Valiant wouldn't get up to much in the initial engagement, she made up for that in the night battle. Over the night of March 28th and to March 29th, Valiant would join Warspite and Barham, and Formidable for that matter, in firing upon, and ultimately sinking, three Italian heavy cruisers, Zara, Fiume, and Pola although the actual sinking was largely handled by destroyers 
after the battleships crippled the cruisers. Notably, one Prince Philip was assigned to Valiant during this action. After Mattapan, however, the rest of 1941 returned to mostly quiet duty, the same as before, with the exception of serving off Crete. During that battle, Valiant was hit by two bombs on May 22, 1941. This caused relatively minor damage that was fixed up in Alexandria over the course of the summer. After which, Valiant had the misfortune to be present during HMS Barham's sinking. This would see her attempt to engage U-331 when the sub accidentally surfaced, and the footage of Barham's sinking was recorded from Valiant. Unfortunately for Valiant, Alexandria would also prove to not be a safe harbor when she returned there afterwards. Her second notable incident in port came on December 19, 1941. In a famous operation, Italian frogmen snuck into the harbor. Both Valiant and Queen Elizabeth would be damaged by mines. In Valiant's case, the mine was placed below the ship due to technical issues. The Italians who placed it were captured and only revealed the mine right before it would explode. Not where the mine was, just that it existed. They were actually locked up right above it, but survived with injuries. Valiant, because the mine was on the bottom, was less damaged than her sister. The ship would be repaired by May of 1942 to sail to South Africa. Full repairs were completed by June, with the ship remaining in Africa until January of 1943, at which point she was in refit in Britain in preparation to support Operation Husky. Valiant departed Britain on June 17, 1943, and from July through September, she was operating in support of the Italian operation. This would see her perform shore bombardment duties with Warspite from September 2nd to the 3rd, as well as covering the Salerno landings on the 9th, and escorting the Italian fleet to internment on the 10th. Valiant only left Italy in October of 1943, just in time for another refit for the remainder of the year, because in January of 1944, she sailed to join the Eastern Fleet. Which sounds more exciting than it actually was, because Valiant would spend much of 1944 on the same old duty, escorting carriers as they performed strike operations, including this time USS Saratoga. And when not doing that, Valiant performed various shore bombardments in the Indian Ocean. However, while this was mostly uneventful duty, Valiant's third and final port incident came in August of 1944. On August 8th, the ship was in a floating dry dock, where various stories come up, ranging from a damaged dock to improper flooding, or poor weight distribution. Regardless of the exact reason, the dock broke its back and sank with Valiant inside. Fortunately, the battleship had steam up and could avoid sinking with the dock. However, two of her screws were jammed along with a rudder. Valiant would be sent back to Alexandria on her two working shafts, while unable to steer a straight course and only managing eight knots. And if that wasn't enough, she also grounded in Suez on October 21st. During this process, two of her shafts were cut off underwater. This was an ingenious operation, but it still left the ship a cripple. As a result, Valiant was sent home and decommissioned by July of 1945, where she was left as an accommodation hulk until ultimately being scrapped in March 1948. A sad end, really, but Valiant certainly proved a tough ship. The damage she escaped at Jutland more than made up for by the repeated mishaps in port. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one.